Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. I have returned, as the dragoons say, after a bit of a hiatus over the past couple weeks, and just in the nick of time, it would seem, markets are in chaos, new GPUs are launching while old used GPUs are flooding secondary channels, and PC gamers have been trying to sort out what it all truly means. Crypto crashing might be good for GPU prices, right? But if there's a recession, it usually means everyone has less money to buy PC hardware. And if inflation goes up, but GPU prices go down, does that put me in a better or worse position to buy? How much much of my food budget should I be setting aside for when I can actually buy an RTX 3080 for 700 bucks like I've been fantasizing about for the past two years is the question that's on a lot of people's minds. These are all excellent questions, but rather than answering them in any substantive matter, I will instead direct your attention to this cat playing video games on a tablet. It's a poignant reminder of what truly brings this community together, the joy of gaming and how it makes us contort our bodies in awkward ways as dopamine floods our brain and distracts us from all that other nonsense. Okay, now that we've had our fix, let's cover all that other nonsense. Excellent! Today's video is brought to you by Lexar SSDs and Memory Kits. If you're looking to upgrade your gaming PC, drop a Lexar NM620 NVMe SSD into your motherboard's M.2 2280 slot. Up to two terabyte capacities are available, and the PCIe Gen 3x4 interface allows for up to 3300 megabytes per second reads and 3000 megabytes per second writes. Or try a Lexar Hades RGB DDR4 Memory Kit, available in 3200 or 3600 speed with XMP 2.0 support, vibrant RGB lighting, and a smooth and stylish design. Controllable by most mother Board RGB software too. For more on Lexar Hades memory or the NM620 SSD, click the sponsor link in the video description. We begin with the big hardware launch that actually happened this week. On Tuesday, AMD's new Radeon 6X50 XT GPUs debuted, specifically the 6650 XT, 6750 XT, and the new flagship 6950 XT. They're all slightly boosted variants of the 6600 XT, 6700 XT, and 6900 XT, with slightly increased core clocks, GDDR6 VRAM that's about 10% faster, and increased board power and pricing. So just to sum up, the 6650 XT has a $400 MSRP, up 20 bucks from the $380 intended price for the 6600 XT, and is about 6% faster at 1080, and about 9% faster at 1440, at least according to TechSpot. This does put its performance ahead of NVIDIA's RTX 3060, although it still can't quite keep up with the 3060 Ti. The 6750 XT is next. It has a $550 MSRP price tag, again up 70 bucks from the 6700 XT's March 2021 launch price of $480, and those price increases are what most reviewers have harped on. The 6750 XT only outperforms the 6700 XT by less than 10%, but it launched with a 15% price premium, which only really makes sense if you're a GPU manufacturer desperately clinging to the maximum margin glory days of the GPU shortage, which is clearly coming to an end even as we speak, or as I speak. I don't know if you've been talking this whole time too, but if you were, rude. And AMD is aware of this, as they did apparently change the intended prices of these cards just before launch to better align with the current market. Leaks had shown the 6950 XT listing for $1,200 rather than $1,100, and launch day pricing for many models still sat at $1,200 or $1,250 for premium versions of the card. Despite this, Brad Sharkus, aka the Chaco Taco Camacho over at PC World, rated the 6950 XT 4 out of 5 stars and gave it an Editor's Choice Award because at the highest end, price considerations become less relevant, and the competition in this range is the RTX 3090 and 3090 Ti, which go for $1,500 to $2,000 these days. The 6950 XT routinely outperforms the RTX 3090, but factors such as ray tracing performance or the massive 24 gigabytes of VRAM on the 3090 and 3090 Ti might be cause for some to stick with Team Green at the high end. All in all, the 6X50 XT launch from AMD is so-so. There are now more Radeon GPUs out there, and they are a bit faster than previous models, but price hikes alongside them sucked a lot of the excitement out of their debut, given how competitive the market is right now. AMD wasn't quite finished though, as on Thursday they debuted FSR 2.0, the next version of Fidelity FX Super Resolution image upscaling technology that has already been quite well received with version 1.0. Version 2 uses temporal upscaling as well as spatial upscaling, meaning it uses previously rendered frames and motion vectors to create a sharper image while also boosting frame rates. The verdict is quite positive, as FSR 2.0 image quality is much more in line with NVIDIA's DLSS technology at similar 
color resolutions and quality settings while also being compatible with a much broader range of hardware. FSR 2.0 works with Radeon and NVIDIA GPUs, even older ones, although AMD is recommending a Radeon RX Vega or RX 590 to start for Team Red, or a GeForce 10 series or 16 series GPU or better on the NVIDIA side for best results. 20 to 30% better frame rates for a negligible impact to image quality sounds good to me, so check out the Hardware Unboxed review for some pixel comparison examples and more info if you're interested. Just beware that FSR 2.0 requires specific support from the game developer to implement, so your favorite game's developers will need to push a client update for you to be able to use it. Just because it has FSR 1.0 support does not mean FSR 2.0 will work automatically. Speaking of supporting open software standards for the good of the PC gaming community, in NVIDIA is doing that too? Am I reading this right? I know, we're probably just hallucinating, but buy the ticket, take the ride, as I like to say. NVIDIA has finally announced that they'll be open sourcing part of their Linux GPU driver. Hooray! Note the exclusions, though. They've announced it. It's part of the driver. It's the first step on a long road, but we'll take what we can get given NVIDIA's behavior in this area in the past. So while NVIDIA will be releasing an open source Linux kernel driver under a dual MIT GPL license, it will not include user space parts of the driver such as OpenGL, Vulkan, OpenCL, and CUDA. Those remain closed source. The driver will also only support Turing-based GPUs and newer, meaning the GeForce GTX 1600 series, the RTX 2000 and 3000, series and Quadro workstation GPUs based on the same architecture. So while this move is undoubtedly a good one by NVIDIA, it is not without caveats, and they are still nowhere near AMD or Intel in terms of Linux support for GPUs. Let's talk about crypto next. Not because I want to, but because cryptocurrency pricing affects the prices of GPUs for PC gamers in this crazy world that we live in. But crypto crashed pretty hard this week, with Bitcoin plunging from around 40k last week to as low as 26 thousand on Wednesday, causing many to wonder where all that money that they conjured up with hopes, dreams, and reckless overconfidence disappeared to. And while markets recovered somewhat and Bitcoin bounced back to around 30,000 as of Friday, the emotional damage was already done, at least according to this Coindesk TV chart showing what appears to be the only two emotions that you're allowed to have when it comes to investing in crypto. We have extreme fear at the moment, when obviously it would be better if we all shift it over to extreme greed. Maybe it's just me, but I would classify both of those emotions as bad. Maybe that's why I'm just not really into crypto. It's probably just the ridiculous GPU prices for the past two years, though. Speaking of which, Ethereum also dipped below $1,800 during the bear run, but it's now back up above $2,000. One coin that has not recovered, or I guess I should say two coins more specifically, are Luna and Terra two linked cryptocurrencies meant to balance each other out so that Terra, aka Terra USD or UST, can maintain its stable coin status with the value aligned or pegged with the US dollar. The algorithm that maintains Terra's stability only works when there are buyers on the market for Luna though, and either due to market forces or maybe other shenanigans, Terra dropped below the one US dollar price this week, meaning people could engage in arbitrage. The practice of taking advantage of a difference in prices in two or more markets by buying Terra for less than $1 and then selling it for $1 worth of Luna. So combine too many Luna sellers with the algorithm's practice of conjuring up more Luna at will to maintain stability, and you get a feedback loop that drove the price of Luna from around 85 bucks in the heady days of last week down to, uh, Somehow it is still dropping, but as of filming, it is worth $0.000273 each. This is despite multiple attempts to stop the bleeding by halting trading, or basically just turning off the Luna blockchain, and it's in complete defiance of Luna creator Do Kwan's confident November 2021 tweet stating that even the concept of this kind of manipulation of his coin is retarded. Classy way to put it, Mr. Kwan, but perhaps your investors might feel that you'd feel more comfortable on the short bus after Luna and Terra's market caps dropped from a combined 48 billion or so down to 2 billion as of Friday. 
Terra remains unpegged from the US dollar while they figure out what to do. It's at about 17 cents right now. And concerned investors are going so far as to knock on Kwon's door at his residence in South Korea to ask where their money went. Major cryptocurrency exchanges have delisted the embattled coins as well, because just think how it looks when the third largest stable coin on the market proves to be exactly the opposite of that. What if people start to wonder if other coins are also built on a foundation of marshmallows and cool whip? What if the fact that one dude who made these coins is able to turn the whole system off and on at will runs counter to the hollowed principles of decentralized finance and its divine immunity from the rest of the financial market? What if people decide to sell off other coins and no one wants to buy them? Those are all good questions to ask yourself. Or alternatively, buy the dip, right guys? Buy those cheap coins while they're still cheap. I should note that none of this is financial advice. I am horrible at that. Efficient tech brief segue, short news now. Speaking of things that will inevitably fail though, Nvidia's LHR, or light hash rate cards, have had a mixed run, with some claiming the LHR feature is useless, while others gave Nvidia some credit for at least attempting to slow down the use of their cards for cryptocurrency mining. And while it took longer than expected, crypto mining platform NiceHash has announced that they've finally worked around the limitations in the most recent version of their quick miner software. That means full Ethereum mining performance on almost all LHR GeForce RTX 3000 series GPUs GPUs just in time for ETH mining to be at its lowest profitability point since 2020. Great timing, guys. Speaking of the slow death of GPU mining, Asus chimed in with some, of, some info on the topic during their earnings call Wednesday, when co-CEO Sai Su said, because the demand for cryptocurrency mining on GPU shipments has been slowly coming down, the demand for graphics cards across the market is normalizing. And that sounds like good news for gamers at first. But then I thought, wait, let's contrast that statement with all the BS we've been fed by graphics card manufacturers for the past couple years. Why are you even aware of this, Asus, if crypto mining isn't what drove high GPU prices for the past couple years and you're so dedicated to PC gamers? Why are you monitoring crypto mining demand directly even? Do you have some big accounts you were working with who suddenly stopped ordering up your inventory by the pallet enough that it warranted mentioning on your official company earnings call? This rankles me. I, I am rankled. ChipFab customers will likely feel a bit rankled as well come next year when industry leaders plan to raise prices again. After TSMC already bumped up prices by as much as 20% back in August, they've now stated they'll be tacking on another 5-9% to 9 in January 2023, according to DigiTimes. This will likely impact pricing on a range of TSMC produced chips and the products that they power, from Apple phones to GPUs for consoles and gaming PCs, and not to be outdone, Samsung has chimed in that they're planning a 15 to 20 percent increase as well. Samsung currently produces NVIDIA's 30 series GPUs on their 8 nanometer node, and while NVIDIA is reportedly switching to TSMC for next gen, this pretty much means that the chips in all high-end gaming products will be going up in price from the fab in 2023. Elon Musk's deal to acquire Twitter for 44 billion US dollars is apparently on hold, and the reason might differ depending on who you ask. Musk would prefer that you think it's because of Twitter bots, those annoying spam accounts, because if more than 5% of accounts are bots, then I guess the deal would have slightly less value for him, despite those bots constantly tweeting positive things about him. But the reason could just as likely be that the SEC is investigating the takeover, particularly Musk's initial stock buy-ups that may not have been disclosed properly, or the fact that the Tesla stock price has dropped since Musk sold $8.5 billion worth of shares last month, while in Intending to use his additional shares as collateral. If the deal does not go through, then Musk will forfeit $1 billion as a breakup fee. So I guess he'd have to weigh that against the absurd amount of free publicity he's received since he went public with this plan in the first place. Let's finish off today with a bit of a palate cleanser though. On Thursday, this video was published by the Event Horizon Telescope, or EHT collaboration, comprised of a global array of radio telescopes. It is an image of the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, called Sagittarius A asterisk. I'm not sure if you're supposed to pronounce the asterisk, but it looks like a glowing red sphincter. 
or like the eye of Sauron before he puts on his contact lenses. It's actually an absurdly dense object, about 4.3 million solar masses and an accretion disk orbiting at near light speed in a space with a diameter equivalent to about 30 times that of the sun, or roughly Mercury's orbit. So gaze upon its majesty and say thank you to all the EHT scientists who work to gather this information and share these amazing images with us. Now imagine how long it would take to travel from our planet to this amazing cosmic structure. That's how long it will probably be before Intel releases their ARC desktop GPUs. But there you have it guys, tech news for the week. And if you liked it, click that like button in the special way that only you know how to do. Your feedback is always welcome too, so please feel free to leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested. You can also check out my store at paulshardware.net for high quality merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies, beer sets, and more. And subscribing is always a good idea so you'll be notified about my tech videos in the future. Thanks again everyone, and we'll see you next week.